Hello and welcome to Dancing in the Shadows, my first official, I'd say this is my first official episode. You know, the previous episode was just kind of an intro to kind of give you an idea of what uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about during this podcast series, Dancing in the Shadows. So I'm not going to tell this story in reverse. Obviously, I'm not going to share why I'm depressed now or I'm in a very depressive state. I'm going to start in the beginning. Uh, otherwise, this, I guess this podcast would be pretty boring if I just started now to describe where I'm at. What led up to it? Well, <laughs> it really starts at birth. It really does. You see, I was born into a religious cult, and I can say that it is a cult now. Uh, up until recently, I struggled with that. So anyways, I was born into this religious organization and raised in a very tight-knit community of people, and I really didn't have very many outside friends. Uh, I had two on my street. Uh, <laughs> two people I still care about to this day. Uh, we don't see each other often. Probably haven't spoken to him in over 25 years. Sorry about that. But life is, uh, life is a journey, and, you know, some people that are in your life um, are there for a short time, but... That doesn't mean that you don't care about that person for the rest of your life, uh, even if you uh, you don't see him. And I think that they know that too, uh, deep down. Yeah, but maybe uh, maybe at some point we'll reconnect again, you know? Life is a journey. So yeah, I'm born into this cult. Many of you will start to pick up on what cult this was as I get into details. Anyways, um, we, we were a fairly happy family in the beginning. I have two younger brothers. Uh, I'm the oldest of three. And we're about um, five and a half to six years apart from each other. Ten years or eleven years older than my youngest brother. And about, I think, six years older than my middle brother. So it's an interesting dynamic. Um, you know, before my other two brothers were born, I can remember quite a bit about my childhood during this time. You know, I'd say probably from four all the way up to, I don't know, eight or nine if I really focus on these memories. Um, I can remember this period pretty vividly. Um, my brother wasn't born yet. Uh, <laughs> we lived in a really small house um, in a town called Carmichael. Pretty small community. Beautiful place to live, actually. Uh, a lot of trees, warm sun, uh, California weather, northern California weather. You know, it's about the best in the world. We don't have hurricanes or tornadoes. We have a lot of sun, lots of uh, rivers and streams. And man, there's so many lakes, great lakes in this area. So underutilized too today. The technology has really sucked people into their own little bubbles. And um, before I digress too much, my childhood was really good for the most part. You know, I had, um, my early childhood was great. Uh, we did move around a lot, and I can tell that there, now that I'm older looking back, I can tell there was a lot of stress in our family. But my mom and dad did a pretty good job at hiding it most of the time, you know. And we were a pretty poor family for quite a while. My grandparents don't owned a waterbed store in the 70s. How cool is that? Um, so I can remember playing behind the waterbeds and, you know, goofing off. While my mom worked, you know, the floor of the waterbed store, there was, you know, 50, 60 waterbeds set up in this place. And people would come in and they'd look at all the different waterbed designs and, you know, the, the inlays and the wood and all of these cool waterbeds that were unique. People are like, wow, these are nice. And they loved my grandparents' waterbed store, and they'd always send their family over, and people would come in and buy waterbeds. And, you know, they weren't cheap. I think they were, you know, two, three hundred bucks, um, even in the 70s, like if you really wanted a nice, solid wood waterbed. And the thing was, is these waterbeds were made by my grandfather. He made all of them. So these were like really um, well-crafted workmanship. I mean, he did, he used solid wood rails. I mean, the beds were quality and, uh, people realized that, um, my grandparents, you know, they, they did pretty well and they helped us out periodically, you know, when we got into tough times. I remember this and I was so, you know, so grateful, um, and, um, I'm so proud of what my grandparents accomplished, you know, back in the 70s. You know, they had uh, two waterbed stores at one time 
One of them was called Waterbed Country, and that was their primary store, and I think they had partial ownership of another waterbed store called The Bed Chamber, which is another cool name. And all of these beds were made by my grandfather, and my uncle Jeff, he would work with my grandfather as well, and they'd make all these really cool beds, and my grandfather and he invented the cap rail, which is this uh, padded rail that goes down the side of the waterbed. Um, they used to be just solid wood and people would, you know, it was uncomfortable to sit on the edge of your bed. So my grandfather invented this rail that kind of snugged onto the side rail of the bed and he padded it with really nice dense foam. And then he would wrap it in vinyl or leather, depending on the client, basically tailored it nicely. They were called cap rails. You know, I'm really proud of what my grandfather, my uncle, and my grandmother, um, you know, accomplished creating their own business from scratch. Really remarkable. They got out of the business. Uh, wow. It's amazing what you can remember when you kind of focus in on it and start diving in. I want to just say that my grandparents and my parents... Um, they really raised me well. Even though I was raised in this uh, cult-type religion, I still had and was treated, for the most part, very well. I'm thankful for that. You know, being somebody who's a, a steward of the world and a good person, um, people that are dealing with their shadows or their darkness, they tend to gravitate towards me. Um, I'm that person. I don't hide behind a veil. Um, I'm this guy because if I did this and this and that. I'm actually, no, I'm actually a person who projects who he is. I don't um, fake it. And I think people realize that authenticity and they're drawn to me. As a result, I've become this kind of person who wants to help anyone that feels um, like they're going through something where they just need someone to talk to. I'm somebody who can give really great, solid advice based on certain situations that people may be experiencing. And uh, one of my friends told me, she, you know, she's like, you know, you're a natural healer. I don't know what you mean by that. I'm just somebody who has experienced a lot in life and I'm, I can offer, you know, real good advice. It's hard for me to take compliments like that. I'm not used to such grace. But they steered my thought process in that direction and I can't turn my back on people. I've never been able to do that. And as a result, I've developed this character that goes through deep swings in emotion because I'm always doing something to inspire or help someone else through a difficult time, whether it's through my own experience or through my experience with them and helping them see a different perspective or make a different decision for the betterment of a situation. But all of that negativity that comes towards me that I have to turn into a positive, it, it does um, take away from my own self, my own being, my life force, I guess, or it steals away my smile little by little. And it takes a while sometimes for me to recharge or find my center again. Sometimes it doesn't happen and I get, I fall deeper and I'm kind of in that place right now, but it's a place I'm, I'm comfortable being, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but I know that um, there is going to be a brighter future, a brighter light, and it's just me pinning down one of the directions that I want to go, because I have multiple directions I could go, and then focusing in on that like a laser, and then moving towards it day by day. And I will pull myself out of where I'm at now. Probably the darkest place I've been in my life, and it involves the loss of my family and this cult religion. There's more to come. And I hope you stay with me. I hope you subscribe. I hope we can take this journey together. Dark shadows can live in both worlds comfortably. The dark and the light. And it's a place that I need to move between if I'm going to continue to help people. And it's something that I have to be more comfortable and learn how to bounce out of that easier. And I think I will get to that point. And I think that um, there's real value in experiencing something that may help others. And that's why I'm here. Because I know that there's going to be people on the other end that have experienced this darkness in their past and wish they would have had maybe um, some guidance through it. Or maybe there's somebody out there right now that's experiencing something dark in their life. 
and they're unsure of how to cope with it. Let me be your guide. I will take you to the light. That is the direction I'm going. And when I describe in these upcoming podcasts my story, you're going to understand why I'm in the dark now. And I'm going to show you how to reach for the light and actually get there. I've been in the dark many, many times, and the light is always the future. Please subscribe. Thanks for listening. It really does mean a lot.